Take your Bible. That's uh, John chapter 8. Um, this is the message that I would have preached last uh, Sunday morning and um, that I didn't get to, uh, but the notes were saved and um, I, just, I just feel like it's, it's necessary. I started out uh, the Sunday before last. Uh, telling you that we're going to follow, we're going to follow the Israelites from uh, Egypt all the way into Canaan land and what Egypt represented. We're going to kind of go over that very quickly and also what Canaan land represents to us dwelling here on the earth. Uh, we know uh, from the scriptures that, um, that those who died in faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11... They died seeking a country to dwell in. And that country was, was basically Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. But they did not attain that country while they were here on this earth. Uh, in fact, every place that the Israelites called uh, their, their place or their land, uh, it, ended up, it ended up being a curse. Uh, when they, um, they, they were in Goshen and um, they had to leave that. And then they went into the promised land and they made a town called Shiloh uh, be the flag, like the first capital of, of, the, of the new, uh, I guess, nation, the new nation of Israel. Um, and uh, God did away with that because the idolatry. And then Solomon builds, uh, David establishes his throne uh, first in Hebron, then in Jerusalem. And so now he's in Jerusalem and he wants to build the temple. God won't let him. So Solomon, his son, God's going to let him build the temple. So he builds the temple and he does it in Jerusalem. We get that last all the way up until the time of Christ. And Christ uh, prophesied that this building would be torn down. They didn't believe it. In 70 AD, uh, the, the Roman uh, legions came down and they burnt the entire city of Jerusalem and they tore down that temple so that it was no more. And it just seems like that every place that man set uh, aside as uh, his Jerusalem or his land of promise or his land where God was going to bless him the most, God always ended up destroying them because of their wickedness. There is a city, however, that God will never destroy. It is called Jerusalem above. It is called New Jerusalem. It's called Heavenly Jerusalem. It is the place where we are guaranteed that God's never going to destroy it. It's, no death is going to enter in. No pain and no suffering. Uh, he's not going to let liars in. He's not going to let murderers in. He's not going to let anybody that doesn't belong inside that city. He's not going to let them into that place. God, God is going to set up a border patrol. Can you imagine that? How racist God is? Amen. Setting up a border control because we don't want certain people coming in our, in our land. Well, that's God. Amen. Amen. That was my two minute political sermon. But anyway. So, uh, they sought a kingdom, they sought a land that God told them would be better than the one they lived in. And so, if you're here this morning, um, and here's, here's how I'm applying these messages, and you can make many applications, as many, as many as you think there are, that's how many applications there are to this. But right now, each and every one of you, maybe in some way or another, is in bondage. And I'm, I made a list. Uh, this is one thing that changed after last Sunday. Is I, made, I added a list uh, to uh, my notes here. Uh, in other words, I made it longer than it actually was. So um, anyway, but for, for those of you that are here, those of you who hear my voice this morning, you are in bondage. To something, whether you acknowledge it or not. This verse here, John chapter 8, um, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, 
Then are ye my disciples indeed. You know, what, you know what the opposite of that statement is? Don't continue in God's word. Cast God's word aside. Throw it away. Move it out. You never read it. Never meditate on it. Never pray over it. Never think on these things. Never have them applied in your life. You have discontinued God's word. And if you have done this, you are not the disciple of Jesus Christ that you think you are. And it all boils down to you. Those of you who know me, know me well enough to know that I'm all about the Bible. If the Bible says it, then it's, then it's right and that we ought to follow the Bible. Amen. If I say something and it may sound real good and the Bible contradicts me, then it's a no brainer. The Bible's right and I'm wrong. You don't even have to ask. It doesn't even need to be examined. The Bible's right 100% of the time. And so that's why Jesus said in verse 32, and you shall know the truth. What is the truth? Jesus said, thy word is truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. That is the worst statement or mistake that you can ever make is to believe that all of these warnings from God, all of these promises from God, they apply all the warnings and all the bad stuff. They apply to everybody else except you because you don't have a problem. Well, let me tell you what your first problem is. Your first problem is denial. You think that all of this preaching and all these verses and all this stuff, you think they belong to somebody else, but they don't belong to you because you don't have a problem. That sounds like a lot of people that I've met over the years that were addicted to something. It's not a problem. They can quit just like that. They just don't want to. But the truth of it is, they are addicted. They're hooked. They love sin. And they see no reason whatsoever to get rid of it right now. It is said that the hardest thing in the world about trying to lead someone to righteousness by Christ through faith is that first you have to convince them that they're wrong. And 99.9% .9 of the people that you ever talk to will not ever admit that they're wrong. They will always say, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't have a problem. I can quit just, I can quit whenever I want to. I don't have to, I don't need this. I'm not like everybody else. And on and on and on and on and on. But that's what Israel said. We were never in bondage to any man. Oh, did they forget about Egypt? Did they forget about Egypt? Did they forget about the Philistines that took the Ark of the Covenant away from them? And was cruel authority over them. Did they forget about that? Did they forget about 70 years in Babylon? Did they forget about the king of Assyria coming down and stealing the 10 northern tribes away and putting them under cruel authority? Has the modern Jew forgotten about Hitler right now? That's dangerous. And by the way, I'm going to say this again. By the way, somebody made me a cup holder. Got it right up here on my pulpit here. So I bought a new cup yesterday. And it only goes down that far in it. So I stick it in there. And it just leans out like that. All right. I forgot what I was going to say after that. So let's move on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I need your help preaching this message. Lord, I need a lot of help preaching this message. In fact, Lord, I would be content to just step out of the way and let you preach it. Because these words, Lord, they need to be spoken right because they are right. They need to be spoken true because they are true. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that in the, uh, in the weakness of my flesh, 
I pray, Father, that you would open up doors of blessing to somebody, open up uh, the windows of wisdom in somebody's heart and help them to see, God, that where they're headed is no good and they need help from you. Whether they want to acknowledge it all the way or not, God, they need help from you. Father, I pray that you'd bless this message. And Father, Lord, may it reach out long after this has been preached this morning. May it reach out to a lost and dying world. People all over the world, Lord, would listen to this. And they would give their lives over to you. So bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. So they, the, um, the ones who were going to kill Stephen... Uh, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they gave him time to share his heart. And this is what he said. God spake on this wise that a seed should sojourn in a, la in a strange land, that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. That again, that four or anytime you see four or 40 or 400 or 4,000, you're looking at uh, number one, what could be a time of probation where God is giving you and y'all understand what probation is, right? In the American criminal justice system, probation is after you've been convicted of, let's say, doing a bunch of drugs. Probation is a time where you can go back and do more drugs. No? Then how come that's what everybody does on probation? They go out and do more drugs and more drugs and, th and they think they won't get caught. No, what it is, is it's a time for them to wake up, realize that they are and could very well be headed for prison and ruin their entire life. And does that stop most people? No, it doesn't. They just play roulette with this thing and hope that it never lands on them again. And they just keep doing the drugs or they keep drinking or they keep partying or whatever it is. It doesn't stop. Never ends. And so 400, pretty much the same idea. It carries with it the idea of the gospel. That his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil. 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. God's going to give them 400 years. And they are going to be in mean Evil authority. Anybody who starts out with a little drink, starts out with a little marijuana, starts out with a little of this and a little of that, eventually it's not enough and it never will be enough and you have to go and take something stronger and, and meaner and harder and everything else. And we're fooling ourselves as a society, as a people, and especially a people in the state of Missouri, we're fooling ourselves into thinking that marijuana is no longer a gateway drug. It is, it was, and it always shall be. All we're doing in this state is introducing people and opening the door for them so that they can go from marijuana to far worse things. What a sick... What a sick people we have become. But anyway, they entreated them evil 400 years. Now, God is going to provide a way out for them, but do they accept it right away? No, they don't. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the bitterness of bondage. The bitterness of bondage. Why does someone smoke marijuana? Why does someone take a gummy of mar with marijuana in it? Why does somebody... Um, get a vape that has a cartridge in it that's full of uh, THC. Why do people do that? It's because it feels good. It feels good. And it feels good for a while. And now, because I guess the state, I don't, I don't even know the state law on the uh, opening up of marijuana for uh, entertainment purposes or whatever, I don't, I don't know what the law says. I just know that what, what limit the law places on it, eventually that limit 
is way too low because the people who get used to that are going to want more and more and more. So it's bad enough to have one set of handcuffs on you, holding you in bondage. But the more you get into this, the more times around the chains are wrapped around your hands, your arms, your feet, your ability to walk, your ability to handle things, to do things, your ability to do anything is now basically destroyed and you are in full fledged bondage. Whether it's to the recreational drugs, the illegal drugs. In fact, let me, um, let me do this. I want you to look up on the screen. These are things I, I spent, I spent some time this week thinking this through. Things that maybe, maybe in and of themselves, maybe they're not necessarily a sin. But they certainly have the potential to bring someone into bondage. Number one, in general, we are in bondage to sin. And everything that God says in His Word that is an abomination to Him or a sin to Him or a wrongdoing, it breaks God's laws, His statutes, His judgments... It goes against the nature of God, the character of God, the love of God. Anything that violates the righteousness of God is a sin. And that sin eventually will bring bondage. So we automatically, when we're born into this world, we're automatically born into sin. You are born needing a Savior. The moment you came out of your mother's womb and you cried that first time, already you needed a second birth. Already you did. That's what the Bible teaches us. And it, and it lasts until you draw your very last breath. When you die in this life, you will die still needing a Savior. You will die still needing a rebirth, a second birth, being born again. And sadly, most people in this world will never know what it is you and I know about Jesus Christ. So let's look at some other addictions. I mentioned drugs. Um, the big one now being talked about, of course, is THC, a derivative from uh, the marijuana plant. Um, who in here wants to admit that you have done marijuana before in various forms? All right, I appreciate that. I really do. I'm not trying to draw attention to you. I just want to make sure I'm preaching to the right crowd. Okay. Um, being high on marijuana is noticeable. Um, you certainly act differently than you acted before you got high. So it is a noticeable thing. Um, I grew up with a kid who lived uh, just down the road from me a little bit. Uh, his parents were very, um, I would say, liberal in child rearing. They basically let, they had two sons and a daughter, and they basically let them do whatever they want to do. And the parents were growing marijuana in the basement of their house. Uh, and, and this friend of mine that in fact, I, I became friends with him and his brother. And um, so they had marijuana in that house. Uh, they had access to all their dad's dirty magazines, free access. And they never got in trouble for any of it. And um, so for some reason, 
When I was about 12 years old, that's who I picked to be my friend. My mom saw it and didn't like it. And she begged with me several times to get away from him. And I wouldn't do it. But she did so because she knew that her son at some point was going to be dragged down into the same pit that he was in and she did not want that for her child. She knew the bondage that sin brings to a young man's life, 12 years old, 13 years old. But my goodness, we're living in a, because it's recreational now, that means people can buy it and just leave it out on the shelf, on the kitchen counter or whatever, at home. And do you think your children have access to that? They do. Just like in days before, children always figured out a way to get into mom and dad's liquor cabinet. Well, now they can get into mom and dad's marijuana stash and they know it. I got to move on with this. Drugs, including marijuana, including cocaine, including crack, including uh, heroin, including um, methamphetamine, uh, including, uh, give me some other ones here. Huh? Fentanyl. That's, that's the killer. That's the killer. The street marijuana that you're buying more than likely is going to be laced with fentanyl. And it's done that way for two reasons. Number one, it's going to increase sales because you are getting hooked on that fentanyl and you don't realize it. And then uh, the second thing that's going to happen is it is going to more than likely kill you. It's going to kill you. It increases the high of the marijuana and it is highly addictive. And don't think it's not. Fentanyl, um, I don't, I guess some people still do LSD or whatever, but these are all, these all, all of them started out in a person's life in the form of marijuana. Alcohol. Uh, we have people in this church whose first drink they took when they were nine, ten years old. Nine or ten years old taking their first drink. And because they liked it, and because they got away with it, they decided to take more and they got away with it and they decided to take more and more. And so by the time, and listen, it is not unheard of in this country right now for the health care system of America to be treating 10 year old boys for alcohol addiction. Why? Because mom and daddy had it around the house and they didn't lock it up. And mom and daddy did it. And if mom and daddy did it, well, why can't I do it? And that's where it went. Alcohol, prescription drugs, um, painkillers. Those of you who know me, you know that that's what I dealt with several years ago. And I can tell you it was bad. Every bit of it was bad. When you run out, you are a miserable human being. Your body is in so much pain that you cannot stand it. You would rather die than to be experiencing the pain that you are in. And I'm here to tell you, um, I went to a pain uh, management specialist and on the first appointment, because of the greed of the pharmaceutical companies, he put me on 10 milligram Percocet three to four times a day, every day. And I didn't need it. But that's what he put me on. So just so you'll know, I'm not talking out of the side of my head and making this stuff up. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if you don't like that, you think pastors ought not make mistakes like that and get involved in that. Well, I can't help it. I did. 
What you don't have are pastors all over the country who are involved in much worse things who won't talk about it. I'll talk about it. Then people who get hooked on fornication of various kinds. It starts out with a little bit of looking at, uh, let's say, un, let's say uh, pre-Garden of Eden clothing. How's that? They start out looking at those things innocently. And by the way, those of you parents who have children, who have phones or tablets, there are programs that will block a very large portion of the pornography out of their devices. But if you think that your eight or nine year old son is too young to be interested in that stuff at that age, I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. You're wrong. Boys, even as young as three, four, five years old, get into that stuff. And that's how it starts. Starts out innocent, then it turns bad. Pretty soon, you're downloading images of teenage girls or boys. And then they're no longer teenagers. And then some of them are not, they're not even able to walk yet. And you're watching videos or pictures of them at the youngest possible age. There is something wrong with you. You got a, you got a devil. You got a devil. And then you convince yourself that you can quit on your own. You can stop it on your own. You need help. You need serious help. And I'll tell you this. More and more and more uh, are police becoming very good at catching the people who are doing this. Unless, of course, they hold a high position in Congress or something like that. And then, am I telling the truth? You'll say amen to that? Amen to that. But that's what it gets to. We have a majority of families in this country where the child is only being raised by half of the parents that they're supposed to be raised by, a mother and a father. And because uh, the dad's gone or because the mom's gone, Mom finds that another boyfriend, but the boyfriend's really not interested in mom. Boyfriend's interested in the kids she has. Listen, I know this stuff, we don't like to talk about it, but it's got to be talked about. These are, listen, this is serious stuff. These are addictions. These are addictions that you, yourself, will end up being and doing. If God does not intervene in your life and stop you. That's exactly what you're going to turn into. Exactly. I had to deal with the situation last year. A young lady, she does not go to this church anymore, but a young lady who was going to this church contacted me on a Saturday afternoon and said that Basically, every time her mom leaves the house, which is every day, her stepdad starts in on her. And I remember when she sent me that, I read it, and I literally went, No! And 
And I had her write down a, or send me a text telling as much as she possibly could. And I hotlined the guy that day. I'm a mandatory reporter. I hotlined that guy that day. And I was tickled to death that they, they sent an investigator out that day. Then they brought in a forensic investigator who believed her story. And she told him things much worse than she told me. Thank God. I didn't want to hear it. But a jury found him not guilty. People, I'm here to tell you that your porn addiction is going to turn into exactly that. You're going to spend a long time in a prison cell with guys who want nothing more than to slit your throat open because that's how they treat guys who hurt children in prison. Violence. You're addicted to violence. Everybody, you're, you're a boxing glove. And when a boxing glove sees something, everything then becomes a punching bag. You'll beat your wife, your girlfriend, because you want your way in everything. Or you came home and she didn't have your shoes sitting exactly the way you like them. Or you, she didn't have your iced tea tasting exactly the way he likes it. And I want to tell you something. I love sinners. And I'm giving you a list here of people that I absolutely will love. And I'm here to help you. But you put your hand on your wife. More than likely, I'm going to do everything I can to run you out of here. There's no call for that. So I'll say that louder. Come on. Let's have Bethel Church take a stand. Yeah. You don't put your hand on your wife. You don't do that. But you're addicted to violence. Because that's, that's your response to everything. He's hurt somebody or tear something up. How about uh, gambling? Is that a problem? People get addicted to gambling? When I was, uh, when I was in high school, uh, we, uh, Jerry, when we had contests out at Jeffco, music contest like in the spring I can't remember who it was but one of them guys sat down and they they pulled up a game of penny ante poker and I I had I had already done my stuff you know so I saw him sitting there and I'm going oh I'm gonna jump in on this so I put change out of my pocket and set it there and I tell you what I won probably five or six games I come out of there with like 10 12 bucks something like that and I'm like yeah I'm good at this. And you know what the Holy Ghost said to me? Yeah, Mike, you are good at this. If I were you, I wouldn't do that ever again. And I, I did. I, I made a promise to God that day. That because I liked it so much, I would never gamble another penny in my life. In heaven. They set up gambling casinos all over the St. Louis area, and now they've had to set up gambling hotlines, gambling addictions. My goodness, they put an ATM machine as you go into the casino. Why? They want you to pull money out of your bank account before you walk in. In fact, they want you to clean your bank account out you walk in so that you walk out with nothing. Gambling. Shopping. Shopping. Shopping, buying things, material possessions, that's an addiction. Religious experiences. People who go in a church setting and the whole thing is about giving them some sort of religious ecstatic experience. It's almost like religious heroin that they give them every service. And because of that, they come back the next Sunday 
either wanting that same experience or wanting something more than what they've got. And I'm here to tell you, you can get hooked on that and you'll die and go to hell because you were religious, but you weren't saved. You can get hooked on fame or pride. Have everybody looking at you, everybody thinking well of you, everybody thinking you're the best. You, that is an addiction. Acceptance by others. I, listen, I know all about this one. But there are people out there who will do anything to get people to like them, people to accept them, people to think that they're really something. It is a serious issue. And then I've got here government slavery. Government slavery. I'm going to say this. If you, if, if the condition of your physical body or your mind is such that you legitimately cannot perform even the most basic of tasks at a place where you can work, I don't have a problem in the world with you getting a disability income. That's what it's for. What I can't stand are the people who get their their first uh, welfare check or their first um, disability check and say, well, and, and they pay you, they back pay you for the last couple of years because you should have got it two years ago. So they back pay a couple of years. You've got like $20,000 now of back pay. And you say, woo, all right, honey. Tell you what, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build that addition on the end of this house like we said. Disability. You know how you can't walk from here to the front door of the store? Right? Okay, now again, if it's legitimate, I don't have a problem in the world with it. But there's way too many people who are addicted to welfare. And you know what? They're in bondage to the government. If the government starts laying down rules and regulations to keep that money coming in, they will have to do it. You are in bondage. Now, um... Turn to Exodus 6. Yeah, Exodus 6. And let me say this. The worst... How can I say it? The worst um, position that you could be in in my opinion, is to be in one of these one of these things where you're in bondage and like it so much that you never ever want to be free again. That's bad. See, God designed it in us. It's in our nature that we don't want to be tied up. We don't want to be held in chains. We don't want to be in, uh, locked up in some place where we can't get out. That's, that's in our nature. God designed us to want to be free. And the worst place for you to be is to desire to be in bondage and then once you're in bondage you desire to stay that way in bondage that's bad so is it exodus chapter 6 verse 2 and god spake unto moses and said unto him i am the lord and i appeared unto abraham unto isaac and unto jacob by the name of god almighty but by the name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, 
the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. So, Canaan land is where you want to be. You're in bondage. You're in chains. Those chains cannot be broken. You've tried. You can't get out of them. There's no way. And so you are stuck there and there's no way out for you. None. And so God has a land that is a land of freedom. A land where we're not under the chains of sin or the chains of bondage or the chains of the Church of Rome, the Church of England. We're not under the King of England. We're not under the Pope of Rome. We're not, we're not servants to them. We are free men. Christ died to make us free. And we are free indeed. Say amen. But... Some people, they just would rather be in bondage. I don't understand it. So in verse 4, And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. The Egyptians are the devil and all of his devils. Yes, your addiction is absolutely has a spiritual connection to it. You see, it's not men necessarily who are trying to keep you in bondage. It is the devil who wants you in bondage. He does not want you free. He does not want you released. He does not want you um, free enough to join Christ's army so that you can defeat him one of these days. Remember what Paul said in Romans 16? May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Somebody say amen. Wouldn't it be great if one day God gave you victory and you put your foot down and said, that's what I've been hooked on. I'm hooked on it no more. Amen. Uh. Let me just let me just share this. I I love my mom and and um, she used to struggle with cigarettes years ago, like 2020. No, <laughs> when we were kids, my mom came to one of these benches way years ago. And she gave her life to Jesus. And she knew that the things that she used to do, she couldn't do no more. And she was asking God to take them out of her life. And she quit for a while, quit smoking for a while. But then some of the old friends that she used to hang with and play cards with, things like that, they would, they would say, hey, can we come by and visit with y'all? We'll play cards for a while, okay? And it was just a weakness of her. She couldn't, she couldn't be around that. And so, lo and behold, it's right back again. And she did that a, a, a couple times. And, and finally, finally, God gave her victory. But she realized that as long as I keep hanging around these people, they are Egypt. And I no longer belong in Egypt. So if I intend to be free from this forever, I need to be done with Egypt. No more going back. I'm going to be done and I'm going to be free. Amen. You look at verse 5 again up here. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. That's what made me think of that. The Egyptians will always try to bring you back into bondage. The old friends you used to hang around, 
the old place you used to work at, the old whatever you used to do and where you used to go, they will always try to bring you back into bondage. So maybe you ought not go to those places no more. Maybe you ought not be around those people anymore. They're no good for you. Amen. And I have remembered my covenant. Verse 6. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out uh, from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. You know what God is waiting to do in some of you? The reason why He has not delivered you is that because on the day that you are delivered, you are going to take the credit for yourself. And God says, I'm not going to do it then. When you get ready to hand over where the credit is due, that's the day that I'm going to release you from your bondage. And so, uh, verse 8, And I will bring you uh, into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for inheritance. I am the Lord. Now look at verse 9. This is very, very important. And I'm going to close with this. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. But they hearkened not unto Moses. For anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Do you know what the Egyptians were successful in driving out of the heart of every one of those Jews? You know what he did? He drove out hope. Hope. Some of you have been hooked on alcohol, on drugs, on pornography. You've been hooked on that for so long and it has such a, such a hold in your life that you have, you have come to the conclusion there is no help for me. There's no help for me. Pastor, I mean, that, that, sounds, that sounds good. That sounds, you know, that sounds religious. But pastor, I just, you know, I've come to the conclusion that once a drunk, always a drunk. And uh, I'm never, ever, ever going to get over this. And... Uh, Try as hard as I might. What's going to happen is, is I'm going to start coming to church and I'm going to start doing better and I'm going to start living for you. And then lo and behold, I'm going to have a bad day and some buddies of mine are going to, I'm going to meet up with them somewhere and they're going to be drinking and it won't be long before I'm drinking too. I just know that that's how it's going to happen. What you don't know is, you have a God whose strength far exceeds the strength of your bondage. The strength of your addictions. The strength of the iron chains that you are in. Do you remember that story where the Apostle Paul, this, he wasn't... The Apostle Paul wasn't in jail because he was hooked on crack, okay? <laughs> but him and, him and I think it was Barnabas, they had been thrown in prison, dungeon prison. And they're in there and all of a sudden they just start singing. What a friend we have in Jesus. All 
our sins and griefs to bear. And they were praising. And they were praying. And tears running down their eyes. And they were having a revival service in there. And all of a sudden. The locks on the doors came open. The chains that they had, were chained to just dropped off. And they're like, hey, Barnabas, move your hand. Dude, hold your hands up. Barnabas holds his hands up. Well, I'll be. It looks like we're free. And then they, the jailer said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh you guys, man, oh, look, it's, it's happening all over, the, all, the, all the prisoners, they're all free, oh my goodness, I'm going to get my head cut off. Paul's like, don't you worry about it. God will protect you. And listen to me, people. You have become convinced that you will never, ever, ever be free. I'm here to tell you, according to the word of God, you can be free. God delights in making you free. And if God frees you, the Bible says, you are free indeed. Never to go back. Amen. Never to turn around. Never to, and now you might want to drink every now and then, but then you go on. You know what? That stuff is slop. I think I'd rather get me some new wine out of the Word of God today. That's what I need. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. I may have preached this better last Sunday than I did today. Listen to me, people. I, I know what it's like to be in bondage. I know what it's like to be in chains. I, you've got a pastor now that's goofed up. He's broken the rules concerning what you can and cannot do. And um, I know what it's like to want more sin. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to... Uh, see the effects that it has on your work on your family on the people around you I know what that's like and I'm just here to tell you if you're here today and something's got you in chains I know what it's like and so this morning, before I pray, if you'd like to uh, slip, slip down here to one of these benches here in the front, we call them the altar, we call them mourner's benches, we call them prayer benches, you'd like to come down and pray on one of these benches down here and ask God for help. Ask God for uh, to help you be free. If you'd like to do that this morning, I'm going to give you a moment. There's nothing in the world like being free. It really isn't. Now I'm not. I'm not perfect. Don't don't even think that I'm saying that of myself. But I'm a whole lot better off than I used to be. 
And I can tell you there's just so much, there's more fun in it. There's more joy. There's more happiness. You don't have to worry about certain things anymore. And I just want to share that with you today. I want you to be blessed the way God has blessed me and to know what it's like to be free. So we have a couple here already. You won't be the first. So if you'd like to come down to one of these benches, all I'm going to do is pray with you. I'm not going to expose you to everybody. I'm not going to tell everybody what you said. I, I don't do that. But you'd like to come down here and just pray. Okay? You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. Come down and pray. Come down and pray. Okay? And we'll see what God does for you and what God does in your life. All right? While we wait and while we tarry.